me up to talk about this topic, which um, certainly throughout all of my training was the thing that always was pushed into the back burner a little bit, because it wasn't as interesting as parapharyngeal space tumours or parotid malignancies or parotid tumours that you could really think about operating on. But it's something as ENT surgeons see an awful lot of, and just because we're not operating on it all the time, it's something that we really need to have a, a good grasp of and an understanding of, especially given that it can be such a varied um, course. So over the next 20 minutes, we'll have a uh, talk about the overview of these inflammatory conditions, what the different ones are, how we might be able to classify them, how you can diagnose them, and also a bit about how you can treat them um, and where surgery is applicable, um, which is essentially not as often as um, you would think. So part of the problem with these is it's hard to actually think of a way of classifying them. You'll read lots of different things in lots of different textbooks describing um, it will just give you a diagnosis for something. So this is a condition. It won't tell you how to group things. And part of that is there are lots of different causes that can interplay, but the background um, pathophysiological process is often quite similar for everything. But I think a good way of thinking about it is those causes that are due to an obstruction of your salivary glands and those causes that aren't obstructive. But underpinning all of this is chronic sialadenitis, so chronic inflammation of your salivary glands. And by necessity, we, um, we'll be talking mostly about the parotid glands, seeing as that's the most commonly one involved. Uh, but this can apply to the submandibular gland, and obviously not really applicable in a lot of cases to the minor salivary glands. Um, it's relatively uncommon, but as a positive predictive value for ENT surgeons, we're going to see a lot more than your average GP. Um, there are causes that are very specific that you can identify. There are also a lot of non-specific causes that aren't specific to the salivary gland, and that's the most common sort. And what we're talking about here is an uh, inflammatory disorder, which is progressive, which is chronic, which is also intermittent. You get swelling of the gland, comes up and comes down, and this leads to overall fibrosis and scarring. And behind all of this is reduced salivary flow. Um, Saliva has a huge number of functions, which we won't go into now, but just with regards to your salivary glands and patient salivary glands, this is helping um, flush through the gland. It flushes through the ducts. It stops mucin from accumulating and getting static within the duct, stops concretions from forming, and helps flush out bacteria as well. And you can see that this is a, a, a cycle that can um, propagate on itself if uh, something goes wrong. So reduce salivary flow, you get inflammation, you get... Um, uh, tissue destruction, which leads to further reduced salivary flow, and this perpetuates and causes more and more of a problem. And part of that allows the ascending infection. This is a concept that I think you should all be familiar with, I'm sure. Um, when you haven't got the downflow of saliva, you've got an open duct, or at least a, a non-flowing duct, which allows bacteria from the mouth, which is a dirty place, to go up, and that leads to your opportunistic infection and repeated infections, which again perpetuates that cycle of reduced flow. Um, histology, uh, again, this isn't something you really need to go into other than maybe for MCQ for the exam, but it occurs in uh, different stages. You've got your early phases where you've got dilatation of the ducts, you get mucus that's um, trapped and stranded there, you get epithelial cells that are shed, and the asini are swollen. And then you start getting the fibrosis and chronic inflammation, and then finally you get the replacement by fatty tissue and scarring tissue and connective tissue. Um, this is how we'll see the patient presenting. Either you'll see them on call, you might um, see them in the clinic after they've been seen by the on-call team, and they'll be coming in with repeated swellings of their salivary glands. It might be painful, it might not be painful, there might be a lump present. That might only happen a bit later on, getting a discrete lump as opposed to a globalised swelling of the gland. And sometimes that lump can be hard to tell, and, and if you're seeing that for the first instance, you might think, oh, this is a a parotid or a salivary gland neoplasm, when actually it's one of these non-neoplastic conditions that's just been there for a long time. So non-obstructive saladenitis, um, you can use your surgical sieve if you like to, to work through the different causes for these, and we'll run through a few of these, um, starting off with the infective cause, and this is what you might see uh, primarily on the acute take, you might see an acute bacterial infection, you might see a viral infection. The viral ones often we think of maybe more in children with mumps, but it can happen in adults and especially those that are immunosuppressed. Um, the bacterial infections, you might see uh, these particularly in a patient that's been on ITU, that's been intubated for a long time. They've got reduced salivary flow because they've got no stimulus going through their mouth. They get stasis of saliva and they enter that cycle of um, reduced flow, inflammation, ascending bacterial infection, um, and then you get a big, hot, swollen, parotid gland. 
So what do we do to treat it? Fluids. Always make sure they have fluids. You want to be giving them antibiotics because most of these, if it starts off as a viral infection, that cycle will have meant you've got ascending bacterial infection and you've got to try and find out what the underlying cause is. So um, have they been intubated for a long time? Are they the 95-year-old lady on the elderly care ward that's you know, chronically dehydrated and diabetic and immunosuppressed? I would also say there's, when you're dealing with immunosuppressed patients, in particular diabetic patients, don't be afraid when you, if you're being... Uh, seeing these patients on a medical ward or if you've been asked to see them by one of the physicians to really ask for a strict diabetic control. Just because diabetic control has been lax and you've been seeing their blood sugars fluctuating up and down, maybe to 15, down to 5, there's a real role in, in not just for these infections but in all um, deep neck space or head and neck infections for getting strict uh, glycemic control during that acute management pathway because that really does make a difference. And often if you're not winning against it, it's because their sugars are still fluctuating. Um, so silosis, uh, this is a non-inflammatory, non-neoplastic condition. And this is where it's really important to be taking a good history from patients that are coming in, finding out what's going on in their past medical history, what drugs they're on. This is something that usually affects the prostaglandin. It's usually painless. So they come in, they've got a progressive swelling of their um, bilaterally of their parotid glands. And you can see the list there of potential causes. Um, and again, it's just important to have that in the back of your mind. It's not necessarily an infective cause. You want to be going through everything and working out what's going on. So other infections, HIV. Um, a small number of patients with HIV will get prostate enlargement, usually uh, non-tender, gradually progresses, but then that doesn't tend to go down after the intermittent phase. What can you do? Well, if they've got a cystic parotid swelling, you can aspirate them, you can give them steroids, and obviously you want to make sure they're on the appropriate, well, maybe not necessarily you, but they're being seen by the appropriate infectious diseases or HIV team and being treated for that. And really, uh, you shouldn't really be needing to operate on these patients. This is um, a bilateral condition. It's going to be progressive. And by operating, you open yourselves up to potentially more complications, as we'll see about in a few minutes. Granulomasis diseases, there's a, a big, long list of these. And these affect the way the lymphatic drainage happens within the gland, so you get an increase in swelling of the gland due to primary um, granulobus infection of usually the parotid gland. Um, the actinomitoses, we usually see these in tonsils, a uh, very common pathogen in tonsils, which is usually uh, inconsequential, but you can get the ascending infection from the tonsils, and it can cause quite a significant suppurative infection of the parotid gland. And this is one of the case, few cases where you might consider draining um, an abscess early, uh, and obviously you can treat them it's sensitive to penicillin, um, the actinomycosis, that can be treated quite well. And again, surgery, other than an acute drainage for a big abscess, isn't really necessary. Cat scratch isn't just in children. Um, again, from paediatric placements, it's one of those things you always think about with a, a lump in the neck that you're testing them. But it can occur at any age. Um, usually happens within a couple of weeks of having the infected scratch. And it's not just your armpit or the local nose. You can get uh, lymph nodes within the parotid effective and then you, affected, and then you get the big um, parotid swelling. And it usually goes down. You don't tend to need antibiotics for it unless it progresses onto a superative infection. Sarcoid, again, can rarely involve the parotid. Um, here for it's again, a nice MCQ question for the exit exam um, when you've got uveitis and facial nerve palsy. Uh, often affects bilaterally. If it's going to affect, you get multiple nodules within it. Um, and even in the absence of uveitis, you can get a facial nerve palsy. And treatment, as you would for systemic um, sarcoid, is with steroids. And again, you don't usually want to be operating on these patients unless there's something else going on. Um, doesn't come out great, but there's a... Oh, I missed it. You can see the, the scan. And that's just a sort of diffuse lump that you get within the parotid gland on sarcoidosis. So Sjogren's, again, this is a, a thing that you might get asked to see by the ophthalmologists. Um, you've got your dry eyes, you've got your inflammatory conditions of the joints, and you've got a prostate enlargement in around about a third of them. Um, Non-tender, uh, comes and goes, and then becomes more permanent uh, in nature. Your... Etiology of this, again, this is just something you'll uh, need to learn. It's an autoimmune thing, second most common after rheumatoid, um, and it's usually women more than men, and parotid gland is the most common salivary gland affected. And you can get the other systemic manifestations of Sjogren's. Um, if you have got prost involvement with Sjogren's, then that signifies that it might be a, perhaps a more aggressive um, form of it, or it's carrying out a more aggressive course. And the reason that that's important is because you get other associations, not just ENT ones with hearing loss, um, thyroid dysfunction, and sinus problems, but you can also get uh, a significant increased risk of uh, malt lymphoma. 
How do we diagnose it? Again, this is just something that you need to learn, the consensus group. So you need four or more of these symptoms um, and across the six groups. So you can see those. One of the symptoms has to be either histology or autoantibody positive, and then you take another three um, from the list. Um, imaging, ultrasound is really useful for it, uh, just to see whether you've got a then a progressive obstruction as a result of it, and you can then perhaps diagnosed a bit more if you've got a good head and neck radiologist based on cross-sectional imaging as well. But a lot of these are history-based and other symptom-based, which is why it's really important to get to the bottom of their background. And again, if you've got suspicion of progressive disease, if there's the thought that maybe this isn't just behaving like a normal Sjogren's syndrome, then you want to be looking at biopsy in the parotid, and that's where an ultrasound is really useful. A good head and neck radiologist will be able to tell you this doesn't look um, like a purely inflammatory parotid condition. Uh, the only time you'd really want to be operating if it's a, a lymphoma is to get more detailed histology. But generally with a core biopsy or perhaps an incisional biopsy, you can get um, everything you need. And then it's the usual chemotherapy for multiple lymphoma. Um, immunoglobulin-related um, cyanadenitis. Uh, this is pretty rare, and you probably will go most of your career or all of your career without seeing this. But again, it's another inflammatory condition um, secondary to uh, Ig related deposition within the parotid gland and you get sclerosis of the ducts um, and again that's treated with steroids. <laughs> so obstructive one is perhaps the one we might think of more in terms of stones and obviously slide this submandibular gland is more likely to get a stone than the parotid gland but you can get it within both. Um, for an obstructive cause it's usually a stone that's uh, present in half them and 25% of these might have more. Um, but you can get other causes, so you might have um, pressure from a tumour, for example. You might get mucus plugging a dehydrated patient. You might get strictures that have happened either from inflammation or maybe a previous trauma um, in Birmingham, and I'm sure elsewhere we get an awful lot of knife wounds and people like to slash each other in the face, and then scarring that results in that, you can get um, strictures of the duct, and obviously if they've got a congenital problem uh, in younger patients. So most of the slivery stones are in the submandibular gland, some are in the parotid, and lots of people have got these small microstones um, that are present, and they're just nothing. They're fine. They have no clinical significance and no real potential to progress on without <coughs> another triggering factor. But when you have got stones, these are the calcium-rich things. It precipitates, it forms, it grabs onto other um, mucin, other peptides that are going through the saliva, and you get these formal concretions forming within the gland and the duct. And this is your sort of pathway to going around to get ductal and stone disease. So you're not getting as much flow through the duct. We've got that cycle that we had before. You get stones forming, they get bigger stones, you get bacteria forming, you then get white cell and immune deposition around that um, little nidus, which then forms more of a, a concrete stone, and then you get your obstruction, and then that perpetuates itself more and more. So how are we going to investigate people? Well, Given that a lot of these things that we talked about are systemic conditions, you've got to be thinking widely other than just your imaging. Imaging is, of, of course, really important in um, diagnosing uh, salivary gland swelling, but you want to be thinking about blood tests. You want to be looking at your um, various screens for your inflammatory conditions, for your sarcoid, um, for your GPA. Um, you may want to be looking at biopsies, chest X-ray as well can be helpful. And then the localised investigations. Ultrasound is probably the commonest one, often your first line investigation, and that can look at an awful lot in terms of the duct, in terms of structure of the gland. Silography is carried out in most places now, I would say. Um, so a bit of dye down the ducts and mapping out the process of those. Cross-sectional imaging either with CT or MR. Um, we've talked a bit about there, about the ultrasound um, and that's the sort of thing you'll see. We're all familiar with ultrasound. And also, you can target it any, anything that looks abnormal with a needle as well. Um, I would say I'd, I'd be interested to hear what the others do. I don't do freehand parotid FNAs. I always do it either with ultrasound myself, or I send it off an ultrasound guidance. And so it's not just thyroid-related. I think if someone's got a big node in the neck, I'd do that in clinic. Um, but when you've got a diffuse swelling or something else, it's really helpful to see what's going on within the gland so you can target your um, needle. But I'm sure we'll hear about that later. Um, Silography, um, again, experienced head and neck radiologists can carry this out. A bit of die down. You can really identify quite clearly where any narrowing or strictures are and if there is um, a stone present, which may make it amenable to other methods of removal. Um, Non-enhanced CT, if you're thinking about stones, if you think about an infection, don't forget you need contrast in there as well. 
and they can be useful. Small stones might be hard to see unless you've got a really high definition CT scan. Um, MRI as well, that can be um, useful looking at the actual soft tissue within the parotid gland itself. It may help um, see things other than stones, uh, give you an idea of any other incidental findings that you've picked up on ultrasound. So treatment, as I said at the start, we really try not to operate on these patients if at all possible. And certainly we don't want to be doing open protodectomy type surgery, conservative management that we talked about before. You want to treat what's going on that's caused this problem. Then can you do anything minor if you've got to do anything at all to treat things? Um, most patients will get better with conservative treatment and certainly a lot of those acute patients that you see certainly will. And it can be reversed as if you treat the underlying cause. Um, Hydration, you can massage the gland, antibiotics if they're needed, painkillers for the acute phase when it's very tender, um, make sure their oral hygiene's good, um, and you can give them saliva stimulants. You want to get that flow working again, but that will only really work if they're also adequately hydrated. So what can you do if you do decide to do something at all? Well, can you get to it in through the mouth? Um, we were just talking earlier about where does silent endoscopy. We don't do it in bone at the moment, although we've been talking about doing it, but that's endoscopy through the duct to try and see the stone then you can use a basket to pull it out and break it up with a laser um, but you know that, that's not available to many of us at the moment um, it is however more available as you can imagine in North America um, you can I think some of the cases report if, if you have to do it repeatedly just like with duct dilatation you can get scarring of the duct which can lead to further problems but certainly for a one-off for a single stone it seems to have really quite good success rates and I mentioned the laser used to fragment these before you take it out. You can use a basket. Um, this has, again, been around for some time. Interventional radiology can go in um, for a small stone, wire basket retrieval, and you can just pull it out. And that can be instantly symptom relieving. You can break them up like you would do with a kidney stone. Um, again, not done as much in the UK. Uh, you can blast them, get them to smaller things, and then you can get them out with a wire basket. Uh, dilatation using um, little lacrimal dilators. Again, this isn't something that I do or have particularly seen done. Um, principle being repeated dilatation, I think you can get stenosis of the duct, especially in some, what, someone that's already got a pro-inflammatory condition of their salivary glands. But that is a potential option for you. Um, ligation of the duct as well. The idea being you stop it, you get atrophy of the duct and uh, atrophy of the gland shrinks down and treats the condition, and you stop the ascending infection going up as well. Um, again, I don't know many places that will practice this in isolation other than as a last resort, um, and you have got quite a big risk of facial nerve damage with it as well. And what about superficial protodectomy? Well, again, I think this is really a last resort um, for uh, sialadenitis, but it is something that's in our armamentarium. It's more difficult surgery, I think, when you've got someone with a pro-inflammatory condition and they're parotid. Everything's a bit more stuck down. It's hard to get the tissue planes. You're always worried about the nerve. Um, there's some evidence of increased nerve risk injury in the acute setting, in the immediate setting, although longer term that probably evens out. But none of us really want to be seeing a patient um, on the ward round that evening or the following day that's got a facial nerve palsy for a, a benign condition. You know, that's really something we want to be avoiding. Um, and what about how much would you do? Would you do a superficial? Would you take out the whole gland? Would you do it without duct ligation? Well, I think most people say that you don't have to do the duct ligation. And also you can leave um, some parotid tissue behind as well. So doing a superficial prostatectomy, you can, if you have to do it at all, that often manages the condition without adding the extra complication of doing a near total prostatectomy, your first bite syndrome, your deeper um, nerve uh, injuries. Um, and you can always go on and go back in and do surgery, but again, you're going back in again to something that is arguably a more difficult operation in the first place. And this is, again, where talking to the patient is really important. Before you go into an operation like this, they have to really understand that you can't guarantee that you're going to be either curing them or leaving them without complications. And many people would um, pull away from that when they know. So whistle stop th tour through um, the non-neoplastic conditions. There's an awful lot of them, and they can be split up in a whole number of different ways. The key behind it is getting an accurate diagnosis, finding out what the causative factor is, and treating that as well as symptomatically managing the patient. Investigate as appropriate. Look for coexisting problems that might be there, uh, and they can be managed, and save your surgery for um, the end-stage disease, if at all possible. Thank you.